Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the third webinar in a five-part series exploring the role that uh, media policy can and should play in supporting a strong, sustainable, vibrant local media sector in the United States. My name is Damien Radcliffe and I'm the Carolyn S. Chambers Professor of Journalism at the University of Oregon and a Night News Innovation Fellow at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism, which is hosting this series. Last month, our expert panel explored some of the transferable lessons from media policy discussions taking place in Europe and Australia. And this month, we're looking closer to home and asking how media policy can support grassroots and community media. This matters because there are many communities and local news creators who don't necessarily have access to the same levels of access to policymakers or indeed the lobbying budgets of larger players. Yet at the same time, they play an incredibly important and arguably an increasingly important role in the local media ecosystem. So today I want to explore who some of these players are, what they do, and how we can ensure they have a seat at the table. And when they do get to that table, what are some of the key policy uh, initiatives that they would like to see put into place? To help us explore this topic, we have three globally recognized experts to uh, chat with us today. Graciela Moshkovsky is the director of the Bilingual Journalism Program and the executive director of the Center for Community Media at Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism in New York. A native of Argentina, she's a multi-award winning journalist, a former Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and a contributing writer at The New Yorker. Graciela has also been a fellow and visiting scholar at New York Public Library, New York University and the Institute for Religion, Culture and Public Life here at Columbia University. Tracy Powell is the founder of the Pivot Fund and the website All Digitocracy. She's the board chair of Lion Publishers and a former JSK fellow and a senior fellow at the Democracy Fund, where she worked on the Public Square Initiative. Tracy is a full 2021 Shawnstein Center Research Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, where she's researching mechanisms for funding and capacity building for media outlets run by and for Black, Indigenous, other people of color and traditionally marginalized communities. Simon Galperin is the founding director of the Bloomfield Information Project and of the Community Info Co-op. A current JSK Fellow at Stanford and a former Reynolds Journalism Institute Fellow, Simon is a journalist, technologist and organiser working in media and policy to strengthen democracy. He runs the Bloomfield Info Project in Bloomfield, uh, New Jersey, which was launched in response to the pandemic and the initiative has been recognised for news product innovation and service journalism and is an inaugural grantee of the New Jersey Civic Information Consortium. Graciela, Tracy and Simon, thank you for joining us today. So uh, with our introductions out the way, I want to try and set the scene uh, a little bit now for people who are perhaps unfamiliar with your work uh, and ask each of you just to give us a sort of short four to five minute overview of some of the main projects that you're working on this space in this space, which really help to set the scene for the discussion that we're going to move on to have. Uh, Graciela, would you mind kicking off for us, please? Sure, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for inviting us. And I think this is a very important conversation. Very happy to be part of it. So I run the Center for Community Media at CUNY's Newmark J School. So we're part of the public university. And our mission is to assist and uh, create resources and connect um, uh, with resources the community media. And community me by community media, we mean uh, media organizations serving communities of color and immigrant communities across the country. So CCM was originally New York centric. Uh, we are based in New York at CUNY at the university. And um, we uh, used to serve for all, more than a decade, um, the more than 300 media outlets serving communities of color and immigrant communities and linguistic communities in New York City. And in 2019, when I became the executive director, we expanded nationally. So we now serve a network of thousands of outlets, um, actually not thousands, but about 1,500 outlets serving uh, these communities across the country. Uh, directly or through our regional partners. And uh, I think for we have about 25 projects ongoing. Uh, they're all our focus is sustainability and capacity building for these outlets. So we do a lot of um, direct support and training and workshops and public conversations. We also do uh, very, I think, important research uh, to fill a void in research about this um, new sector. But I think the project that we are doing and that we are actually expanding now that is more re most relevant for today's conversation is our Advertising Boost Initiative. And I think Nick here is going to drop the link to the report where we, where if you're interested, you can get all of the information about what I'm going to say in very brief three minutes. 
So this project is a project that uh, is a pilot project that we launched in 2019 to connect New York City, uh, uh, gover the New York City government ad budgets with the community media sector. So the origin of this project uh, is, is in 2013 when the center uh, conducted a research to show, uh, to try to understand how New York City, more than 50 agencies placed their ads in, in, in the city. So where did the, this um, ad, you know, uh, dollars went? And what we found then was that 82% of those um, ads went to, uh, and this is of course, um, government funding and tax money, it went to only a handful of mainstream, uh, so-called mainstream media outlets, basically, you know, the New York Times, the Wall Street, the Wall Street Journal, the uh, uh, New York Post, etc., and um, did not, and only, um, uh, that was 82%, and 80, uh, 18%, um, only 18% reached the community media, as I said, more than 300 outlets serving uh, a large population in the city and basically serving most of our immigrants and uh, people of color in the city. So that seemed like a, a outrageous disparity and also didn't seem like the best use of tax money by the government because uh, a lot of these ads were supposed to uh, serve information needs and connect these communities with, uh, you know, city resources. And um, they were targeted for the these communities, but they were not placing the outlets that were actually reaching these communities. So that started a process that led in 2019, in June 2019, to the um, to Mayor de Blasio signing an executive order, Executive Order 47, that uh, mandated all uh, about 50 agencies, 50 city, uh, city agencies, to place at least 50% of their ad dollars or their budgets in community media outlets. And we started this project, uh, the Advertising Boost Initiative, at that moment. So what we wanted to do was to, one, monitor the compliance with this executive order, and then also act as a bridge between the city agencies and the ad agency and the outlets to make sure that the outlets really got their fair share of this advertising funding. So just to clarify, in case this is not clear, this is not a new budget that was created. This is not government money that was you know, now kind of reallocated to go to the outlets. This is money that exists in every year's budget that is always allocated to um, advertising, that it, um, it's part of the government's um, mission and obligation to keep their citizens informed. So the budgets all existed and they, they are always allocated, but they just did not reach most of the outlets serving the majority of the population in the city. So what we did is we hired a, a full-time person, Darlie Gervais, who's been incredible. And what she did is she created first a series of uh, guides and directories and uh, information um, lists. So to, to assist the outlets to understand um, how to pitch themselves to the agencies and how to understand what the campaigns were and how to get this funding and these ads in their publications and then, um, or their, you know, uh, websites, this only um, impacted, um, this only included digital and print outlets, uh, which is the majority of the community media sector. And then at the same time, we, um, part of our mission was also to educate the city officials who were making the decisions on ad placement. So we, uh, that was a very successful project. Uh, in the year that we started was the first year of the pandemic. Uh, we, we saw uh, an over, um, you know, it was not just the 50% that was mandated, but 84% of the ad of the ads went to community media outlets, and that is about 10 million dollars in a year. Uh, this is 2020, most of 2020. So in a year in which uh, our, we saw the outlets um, hit hard by the pandemic economically, um, our, our publishers lost in some cases 100% of their regular advertising um, revenue uh, because uh, a lot of the uh, ad advertising that supports community media are local businesses that advertise in the outlets that serve their own communities and those businesses you know shattered or they were just not they didn't have the, the resources and the communities were the hardest hit by the by the um, pandemic as well so this funding really saved the sector and that's what we um, explain in this very long and uh, detailed report you can just read the executive summary but we have like 40 pages explaining and with data and uh, quotations from the publishers to explain what it meant. And so we are now, after that, it was so successful that um, 
we expanded it. Uh, this is we are also grant funded, and we are funded by the, a local foundation in New York, the Redstone Foundation. We just renewed the funding for two more years. We are now into at the end of the second year. We are expanding to New York State. We are trying to also now try to work with uh, state um, agencies, uh, uh, marketing directors, and advertising. Um, uh, people to um, expand to uh, outlets uh, outside of New York City and in the rest of the state. What happened in the middle of that is that um, the executive order was actually turned into legislation by city uh, by the city council in June this year. So now there's there's a law, there's a piece of legislation that mandates city agencies in New York to place at least fifty percent of their ad. Uh, of their ads in the community media sector and that and now it has also broadened to include broadcast so it's also radio and tv and uh, there's a, a new piece of legislation a bill that was just introduced in the um, uh, new york state legislature to also try to um, uh, it's more about it, it's closer actually to the tax um, to the to the to the other project that we're going to talk later to the uh, uh, bill to um, um, offer tax cuts or you know benefits uh, to local media. Um, so we are monitoring how those um, pieces of legislation and how policy is shaping in a new way, in a completely new, new way, this conversation. And our mission is to see how the community media, um, you know, to make sure that, you know, to advocate for the community media and make sure that they are part of the larger conversation about the future of news and local news in particular. Was that five minutes, was that longer? I don't know, but it was great regardless. So thank you, Graciela. And there's fantastic news that both in terms of uh, that spending and also the fact to hear that this is now uh, baked into legislation and potentially providing a precedent that other cities and other states can also follow, uh, which is great. I assume that one of the, there's kind of, there were probably dual challenges with that, both in terms of um, government understanding how to work with the sector and even being aware of the size and scale of the sector. Um, and also, as you kind of alluded to, then ensuring that community media organizations understand how to pitch to and communicate with City Hall. Uh, well, not with City Hall, that, that's already actually, uh, the legislation has been passed already in the case of New York, right? But uh, yeah. with the, the actual challenge, and this is a very important actually question because legislation is not enough. So political will and legislation is, is, a, is a huge first step and it's very important. But then um, it's really easy for a, bureau, a, a big bureaucracy like New York City or New York State to actually not um, comply with it or to find shortcuts or to find waivers. You can actually ask a waiver if you are an agency and not place the ads in the community media or the local media sector. Um, so for us, it's really important. There's an education piece of it. We found that actually all the marketing direct, the people who make it, it's, it's kind of decentralized. So it's very, it's various people making these decisions. So we work with the agencies that are the most, that have the, the largest budgets mostly, or, and that have a media budget, not, not all of them do. And it's really an effort. The effort has been in, in educating, um, and I don't say educating in a patronizing way, by like you know sharing information and giving the enough data for these um, public office officers to understand or officials to understand the value of the community media. So one of the things is so you're not going to get you know massive organizations reaching like a, like millions of people in most of the community media sector or in most of the local media. Uh, you know, for that matter, but you will find, but you have to see that these are the only outlets serving communities that would be completely deprived of information if it weren't for these outlets. So they might be very, uh, it's like niche. A lot of them are niche organizations. They're critical in the life of the city. For example, you have, you know, the only, uh, it, New York City has 40% of its population is, was it's, it's immigrant communities, it's, it's people who are not born here or who are foreign born. Um, and so, and, and we have in the community media sector outlets serving people in communities in more than 30, it's 36 languages other than English. And so, we, you know, there's outlets that the, the, the Urdu speaking community um, get their information from their Urdu language publications and there's no one else serving those communities. Same thing with a lot of Spanish speakers in the city and a lot of, you know, uh, Chinese speaking, speaking people in the city. So uh, just to convey the value and the, and the importance of this sector that has been, 
you know, marginalized and ignored, not just by the public sector, but also by, by their colleagues in the mainstream media uh, world and in academia and by media critics. Uh, that, is, that is our job to, to, to make the case. Um, and it's very easy to make when you have the data because it's true uh, about their value. Fantastic, Graciela. Thank you. I'm sure there are going to be many parallels with some of the things that uh, Tracy is going to uh, talk about. Really keen to hear from you, Tracy, about some of the work you're doing at uh, the Schoenstein Centre this term, but um, also in particular to hear about the Pivot Fund, which you recently established and which I think is a terrific initiative. Just need you to unmute. Unmute. Thank you. Thank you um, very much for that. And yes, Graciela, you are great. You're a tough act to follow, but I want to try. Um, so I, I think the work that I've been doing for the last um, several years started really, um, you know, right after law school when under, I had a really clear vision about media policy and how it fit into my world of journalism. And I wanted to try to explain that to other journalists, help them understand what was happening in terms of this, you know, this changing media landscape. And so one of the first things I started writing about a lot is broadband access. And I couched it in terms of, you know, the times Picune deciding to um, reduce its print schedule and um, go to all digital for, I think, um, three days out of the week, they would print and the rest would be digital. I wanted people to understand that even in New Orleans, um, there existed news deserts and broadband access was, um, you know, uh, spotty in a lot of places. And so, you know, for, for a lot of people being um, online means being mobile. It did not mean have you know having access to broadband, and so that was an issue. And I wanted journalists to understand why they should care about how we were changing our business models um, and how that impacted uh, communities that didn't who already had limited access to quality, incredible information. That led to you know talking a lot about net neutrality, um, ownership issues, and then eventually brought me into the world of philanthropy, where philanthropy policy and journalism intersected. Um, I began my work, as you said, with the Democracy Fund, um, trying to figure out how to best support these community organizations that Graciela is talks about, um, how to dis distribute those philanthropic dollars more equitably um, to these community outlets. Eventually, I launched um, the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund. I was the founding fund manager um, where we, um, work to increase the amounts of money um, accessible to these small independent BIPOC news outlets. Um, I did that until May and then um, in May, um, over the summer, I decided to launch the Pivot Fund, which seeks to do the same thing to support um, community outlets led by and for communities of color and other marginalized groups. Um, we do that through general operating, providing general operating capacity technical assistance project dollars as well, um, and also supporting collaborative journalism. And so um, I'll stop there because I know we are sh you know, short on time, but those are, I'm happy to expand on any and all of that. Great, thank you, Tracy. And as I mentioned in the chat um, uh, just now, please do feel free to uh, send questions our way during the course of this hour long session. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I know there's so much we could talk about. We could talk for hours on this topic, but we're gonna cram in as much as we can into an action packed 60 minutes. So without further ado, we'll hand to Simon who will tell us a little bit about the Community Info Co-op and the Bloomfield Info Project. Thank you, Damien. Um, so my name is Sam Galperin. I, I founded and run the Community Info Co-op. We're an organization focused on democratizing journalism, media, and technology. Um, our chief initiative is the Info Districts Project, uh, which envisioned a public utility district model for local news and information. Uh, in the United States, they're called special service districts. Uh, often they fund libraries or fire departments or um, sewage systems or sanitation services. And we could leverage those same models to fund local news and information as a public good in our local communities. Um, so we've been working on that for a few years. In 2020, we launched the Bloomfield Information Project, which is our lab to explore practical pathways to establishing a local a community run news service that could eventually ideally be funded publicly. Um, and um, in addition to, and ultimately just to, to create a, like a model and a new standard for 
like public access, hyperlocal public access media in the present day and age. Um, in addition, I do some other sort of ecosystem support. Uh, most recently, I helped organize a cooperative fund for community media publishers in New Jersey called the New Jersey Community Media Collective, where we are get, get we are all participatory media projects coming together to figure out how we uh, can coordinate and grow the grow the ecosystem for all of our benefit. Um, thanks. Great, thank you, Simon. And I, and I think if I'm if I'm right, you know, you're you you're enacting this in the community in which you live. So you are absolutely living and, and breathing this in uh, Fairlawn, New Jersey, which I believe is, is that right? In Bloomfield, in Bloomfield. Bloomfield. That, in Fairlawn was where where my, was my original was my hometown was where I thought of it. You know, the original yeah. sort of space. But now Bloomfield, it's it's a slightly larger community. It's a more diverse community um, with more. Challenge the challenges that I think are actually really symbolic of the state as a whole and ultimately the, the nation, probably. Great, thank you. The clue was in the name there. I should have clocked that it was, of course, that it was going to be Bloomfield, New Jersey. Um, uh, we'll quickly go to a question that we had from uh, Joe Amtis, uh, uh, Amtis at uh, Montclair University, just picking up on something that. Uh, that Tracy was saying about the pivot fund um, and because I do want to get to as many questions as we can so uh, Joe asked Tracy whether you received any pushback from traditional funders when trying to launch the pivot fund. Um, pushback in terms of not wanting to support BIPOC media, uh, push, I, I guess. I guess so or resistance or I mean I think one of the things you've also talked about Elsewhere, I know is that you've said you want to bring in people who perhaps haven't traditionally supported journalism, and that's a really important part yes. of your mission. But uh, those organisations may also be the ones that get interrogated by the journalists and the journalistic efforts that they yeah. are supporting. Yeah. So Democracy Fund has this really great study that that they um, commissioned right before the Reg Fund was launched that show, I believe, less than two percent, maybe. One, less than 1% of philanthropic dollars went to BIPOC-led media. Now that still um, is increased um, in the last couple of years, thanks to REG and, and Democracy Fund and other um, players right now who are um, really emphasizing more equitable philanthropic giving, but it's still, um, I believe, less than 8% that goes to BIPOC-led news organizations. So. Um, when you say pushback, I would say that um, I wouldn't characterize it as pushback. I would characterize it and say that um, philanthropy needs to change just as journalism needs to change. Disruption needs to happen. Um, funders, donors tend to want to flock together, follow each other um, in, in terms of supporting um, certain organizations. There's still um, dollars heavily go, going to um, white-led organizations who say they serve people in communities of color. Um, and nobody on this phone call is guilty of that, but there are quite a few um, organizations out there who are guilty of building their business models on the backs of publishers of, of color. And very few, little, few of those dollars go directly to publishers. You know, the Pivot Fund um, seeks to give directly to community-led news outlets, directly to the folks who are out there, who are out there providing and producing critical, critical information for the communities that they're embedded in. And so sometimes it's hard for donors to see, um, I'll say, quote unquote, scale, because these communities are so small. Um, and so we have to talk about a different definition of scale. So when I go in there talking about wanting to provide dollars to these, um, you know, two to five person news outlets, sometimes donors really, they see the, the large regional metro daily newspaper in the community um, or, you know, the big uh, ProPublica like um, organization and it's harder for them to see and understand the impact of these small organizations. So it's incumbent upon folks like me and Graciela and Simon to explain that these are the these are the organizations, the people who are already entrusted relationships with the communities they serve. And sometimes that Spanish language um, radio program or radio station or the black newspaper is that community's only source of information um, because the larger players just don't 
um, have the relationship or the trust from that community. So I wouldn't say pushback. It's, um, it's more of a process of helping donors to understand um, exactly who is um, creating and doing the work that's meeting the information needs of, um, of hyperlocal communities. Thank you, Tracy. And I'm so glad you mentioned scale there, because one of my suppositions when I was working with Nick to put together this panel as part of this, this series, one of my assumptions was that um, it can be very hard for smaller players to get a place at the table. Is that fair or have I got that wrong? Uh, Simon, what's been, what's been your experience? How easy is it to get a seat at the table? And uh, if it's difficult, what can we do to, to remedy that? And then we'll, we'll hear from others on that question too. I probably, it depends on who you ask and how and how and whether or not they expect to have a seat at the table. Um, some people will, you know, say they're realists and the best we could do is a tax credit. That mostly goes to like the media conglomerates that already run the world and doesn't really do much for local journalism and community information needs. And that's what we get because that's what we got. But um, I, I think that, the most the most progressive thoughtful substantive solutions aren't even on the table when it comes to media policy discussions um and i think it's because a lot of bigger players are taking up oxygen and a lot of people with resources aren't letting those resources flow and there's like a false scarcity being created in the ecosystem which again like we described with like where capital concentrates in instead of going to community ethnic media it goes to where it's easiest where it's where capital already is so i think that that's like a larger systemic challenge and fixing that policy organizing i think uh at, at minimum one thing we can do without um, any legislative change which is his own question is have uh foundations begin to spend down their endowments um in a significant way because i, I think there's a there's a there's a there's a, um, a, a, a like a systemic crisis, like a, like like a, like a major systemic crisis happening in journalism and, and around the planet in a variety of ways, and those resources might not just like are going to be less effective in the future when the crisis is worse. Thank you. Well, we're going to talk more about kind of aspirations and some of the things that we would like to see uh, in a bit, and I, you know that's a great example of one potentially actionable thing that foundations can do. I'm also curious for Graciela and Tracy whether one potential solution for getting a seat at the table is the kind of networked effect that you see through Lion and through uh, CCM that actually this becomes a much stronger voice and body when speaking as a collective voice. Is that, uh, is that a fair assumption? And again, what are, what are the challenges of that? Because just organizing that is not, not easy as we all know. Right. So, yeah, I think um, as Chair Lyon, I, I can honestly say that some of the peer learning and um, re existing relationships, not only among membership, but staff and the board as well, lends itself to opening up resources and capital, particularly for, um, for the publishers themselves, the member publishers themselves. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that Lion is working on right now is really kind of diversifying its membership and making sure that we are re truly reflective of um, the communities that our, our news, or news outlets serve. So bringing in more of those voices that tend not to be at the table. But I, I do think, you know, we've done a great job kind of um, channeling resources and trainings and expertise to our membership so to help them become more um, to make their businesses more sustainable yeah to add, to add to that i just i just wanted to go actually to connect that with the question with the previous question which about scale and size i think the the, the issue um is not just the size it's not that the small guys are not invited to the table because they're so small, nobody sees them. I, I think the, the issue is what, it's still a, a, a view of what the news media industry is in this country and how there's been this, you know, you know, for decades and decades, there's been this idea by mainstream media, by policymakers, by, you know, decision makers, that the media system or the media industry 
is just, you know, a series of organizations, most of them white led, you know, uh, very mainstream um, and and very that don't really rep necessarily represent the communities where they are um, meant to serve the gen general public. And, and this assumption that those outlets, like the Metro Papers in this country, you know, like the LA Times is a great example, the assumption for decades that they were serving the entire city of Los Angeles. And then you go, uh, you know, deeper and you look at the data and, you know, the data has been published by themselves uh, last year. And you will see that they've only served a small part of that city, leaving out, for example, the almost half of the Latino population of the city. I mean, the, the Latino population, which is almost half of the of the city population. So I, I think it's just I, I, the same thing with the, all of these new desert uh, projects that until recently you saw uh, these maps with all of these deserts. And then, you know, we would go and look at those deserts and say, wait a minute, there's 400 outlets in these deserts that are black media, Latino media, Asian media, native media. And they are still there. There's no desert for those communities. And maybe those cities are most a majority made out of, of those, um, you know, communities. So it's you who's, who are seeing the desert. That it is not really, it's just because the outlet that you knew and served you disappeared. So I think that that, that is a mind frame that is very hard to change. There's enough data, there's a history of the media told by this side of these communities. So these communities, these outlets have been there to serve those people who were never served by the mainstream media outlets in the first place. So, and so, and it's still very hard to be seen and to be recognized and to be treated as equals by their partners, uh, by their, sorry, by their peers and by others. But what I've seen is that, that coalitions, as you were saying, Damien, coalitions are being, I, I, I think, are, 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 are effective. I think uh, you see that there's a new, there's a task force, a coalition of outlets and organizations in Illinois now trying to, you know, uh, uh, come up with legislation to to get more, to empower local media and that, you know, and this, the community media ha had to fight their spot at the table, but they got it, they got in and they're part of that. Same in California, there's a, you know, there's legislation that has been passed there and that is now being considered. It has been pushed by coalitions of outlets that include outlets serving communities of color. So I see in that, you know, in that there's two things that the power of the collective, but also the uh, recognition that this, that the, that the, of the value of these outlets by their own peers. And is there a risk that that recognition, what one person in the chat referred to as kind of journalism with a capital J, uh, continues to risk being overlooked? I mean, we're having this conversation at an interesting time with the House having passed the Build Back Better bill that we're now waiting um, on the, the Senate um, to hopefully pass that uh, in quarter well, they one. They just pushed it to, to January, no? Today. Yeah, they I'm pushed sorry. it. Yeah, they have oh, pushed it to right. January. And I'll, and I'll post a link to Rick Edmonds' update on that that was in uh, Pointer uh, earlier on today. Um, there's obviously some enthusiasm and excitement for this um, and uh, potentially some some positives from, uh, from these moves to support journalism. Um, but I think there are also some systematic weaknesses in it too and perhaps we could um, unpick a little bit about those kind of strengths and weaknesses before moving on to uh, what you would like to see instead. Um, Tracy, do you want to start off with this? I know you've op openly said that um, you think this reinforces a, a broken media system so perhaps we could hear from you first and then we'll hear from Graciela and Simon. Yeah, I think um, you're right. It, it, it kind of reinforces the status quo which in my opinion is, is um, reinforces a broken, broken system. Um, part of why we still have this issue is because there weren't enough voices, I believe, at the table to inform the kinds of solutions that were created or drafted. And so if there had been more um, diverse, inclusive voices at the table, um, the, the, the drafters of the bill would have had a better understanding of how these smaller independent news outlets work. For example, with what's in the Build Back Better bill right now, um, the $25,000 tax credit if you employ um, a certain number of journalists at a certain size news organization. Well, 
had they talked to us, had they talked to more of us, um, it would have been understood that a lot of these organizations, especially hyper-local community organizations, have fewer than five employees. In fact, they might just have one or two and they rely heavily on independent contractors, freelancers. So they would not be able to benefit from that piece of legislation in the way that a larger news organization would. Now, I, I think there, there's a cap on the number of employees, but if you look at some of these, um, you know, these metros, they meet that cap. <laughs> and these are the same metros that have created tons and tons of harm in communities. Um, and um, they're going to be able to benefit from this. There are hedge fund owned newspapers that would be able to benefit from this at the expense of um, news organizations that are really um, in the business of providing and meeting critical information needs of their communities. Simon, uh, I mean, you are in an interesting position of being somebody who would potentially be in this space and um, with, with your work and, and projects and presumably in, ineligible. Oh, yes, ineligible. Yeah. So could so you say, say a little bit more yeah. about, about, I mean, that must be frustrating given the important work that you're doing. So um, perhaps you could say a little bit more about uh, how that could be fixed or, 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 or remedied. Right. Um, so I think that I think that the conversation, and not to uh, not to take away from the conversation around the specific policy that's in the ether right now, but um, I think the issue is more of like we need to invest money in creating new things, and less into invest money into sustaining the current thing, because the current thing is just not. It's like it it has a lifetime, and that lifetime is going to end at some point, and we're just like we're just stringing it along, and I think that. Um, you know, I think one of the things you hear is uh, uh, the, the comparison I make is like is like giving tax subsidies to like fossil fuel companies while we wait for them to transition to like a green economy. Like ultimately, like we can just create alternative systems and put those same workers and those same that same talent to work in a different space. So they can increase the tax credit, great, make it more expansive, more inclusive. Yeah. But that's ultimately not going to change what's really happening on the ground, which is there are no local news organizations to invest in in a substantive way across the country. And, and, or, and if they are there, they need massive investment, like serious infrastructure, technical, financial operations, all these different things. So we really need a movement for a new version, for, for a new local public media, leveraging the existing community ethnic and language language like community media we need libraries we need peg stations we need the fm radio we need all of that and we just need to sort of realize that we need it so we can start working towards it because if we're always relying on whatever Gannett says because they have the best lobbyists in washington we're just not going to get it very far can I just just add real quickly, Simon, on um, that we've we've been here and done this before. We did this with when the Public Broadcasting Act, when you know the government decided to, to you know inject money into you know PBS and Sesame Sesame Street is what most most likely comes to mind, and lots of um, um, independent and um, people of color media was left out. They are still banging down the door trying to get their fair share of some of those federal dollars. Um, and I think this, you know, while this act is a start and you know, people like to say that's a start, um, it's still a conversation about um, saving newspapers instead of saving local news. And there's a really nuanced distinction there. I'm not in the business of trying to save these local newspapers. Um, I think it's about time that we acknowledge that we're past that now. We really need to be talking about saving local news. And that looks a lot different than trying to save, you know, what's left of McClatchy or the net or whatever. Yeah, and you both make such great important points about that this doesn't work for small organizations, those that are reliant on, uh, on freelancers, 
Um, and it also is about supporting existing providers rather than helping to, to fill, fill gaps. And of course, as you've also both alluded to, that uh, this is about really supporting journalism that looks like in very much inverted commas, traditional journalism. So what does this mean for communities that are supported by newsletters or podcasts or WhatsApp groups, for example, which are absolutely yeah. legitimate information sources um, that are incredibly valuable to those communities. Um, before we come on to solutions, I do want to hear from Graciela. I'd be really, I'm really curious to hear what your community and your network is feeling about the proposals that are currently on the table. So I, I really think that, you know, I'm not a policy expert, but I think uh, I've been following this and talking to the people behind it and, and to our outlets. And, uh, you know, the community media sector is a very uneven and, and very, you know, uh, it's, it's not like everyone is the same and it's not, there's a lot of, there's plenty of outlets that we serve that are larger newsrooms. And we actually have, uh, we've created all these, uh, we've been mapping these sectors because we found that it's really hard to say anything that is true unless you have, you know, data and, and, and you can prove it. I mean, I'm a journalist by training, so I'm always looking for data to support my, my you know, my assessment and the programming that we launched. So one of the things we found, we have a, a map and a directory of uh, more than 600 Latino media outlets. Most of that is Spanish language, but it's more complicated than that. There's other languages and many formats and very small and very large and medium um, and, and very local and national and by identity or by you know, issues and topics. Same thing with black media. Black media is, we have around 400 media outlets in our directory and map. And there are there, you know, uh, uh, you know, papers who've been serving communities for 100 years who have more than five employees and who have, you know, full time staffers, 25 staffers, 50 staffers. There's a lot of Chinese media papers that are big and robust operations. There's a Japanese paper in LA. I can give you so many examples. So I do think that a lot of those outlets, I mean, a, a, a big portion of the community media sector and many outlets serving communities of color would benefit from this. I don't know if that's the best piece of legislation you can have to save you know, local news. I, th I think it was not meant to be the only one. There were others that were, that were just killed by, by politicians. There was, there was actually a, a proposal, a bill to, um, to allocate uh, you know, uh, federal advertising funding to go to local media that is not, didn't make it to the bill in the end. Uh, and I feel like, you know, instead of, um, you know, I, 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 I believe like Simon, that it's good that we need to build new things, but I do think that a lot of the things that have been there uh, are really worth um, supporting and, and keeping. And that includes mainstream media outlets and that includes, um, you know, community media outlets. And I think there is an expertise and a value and, uh, you know, trust that was built uh, through a couple of generations. And I do believe that that deserves serving. I don't think everything should be nuked. <laughs> I mean, just, uh, you know, kind of tabula rasa and, and start from zero. But I think there's actually, and Tracy is supporting a few of these, um, several of these organizations. There's um, these very powerful new uh, entrepreneurs and this movement of, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs of, of color who are building incredible uh, news organizations. Um, and I think there's room for, for all of these um, in this com in the conversation and in the, you know, the question is uh, where the resources are coming for this. And I think people are getting very creative. Uh, you know, the younger, particularly the younger entrepreneurs are getting very creative in ways of, you know, find, finding uh, resources. I was just talking today with Madeline Baer who runs El Timpano out of, uh, you know, Oakland. And she has this, uh, she doesn't want to get you know, uh, I don't want to speak for her, but this was published, so it's not, it's not, a, you know, it was, there was a, a piece that just came out and um, about that, uh, I think, uh, I think I saw it, Tracy, today in the Lions newsletter or something, um, but it's about uh, having these civic partnerships where she partners up with, uh, mm -hmm. like, the Department of Health in the city of Oakland, and they support, um, you know, they, they fund uh, a sponsored content that actually is information that needs to get to these uh, Maya, uh, Mayan and, and Sp 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 Spanish speaking communities in Oakland. And, you know, she is one of her main sources of revenue. So I think, you know, the, this bill is just one solution that was proposed. I don't think it's the only one. And I think there's so much happening. It's actually hard to keep up. So Graciela, I want to talk a little bit about that advertising 
tax credit that was in the original language and was dropped. Um, I, it provided tax credits to businesses if they advertised in their local newspaper. So if I am a business and I'm already planning on spending $1,000 to, to advertise in, I don't know, let's just say, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the, the Chicago Tribune. Um, and then I get a tax credit where I can spend an, an additional $1,000. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to buy a bigger ad in the Chicago Tribune. I'm not going to spend that second thousand dollars with the Chicago Crusader um, or Cicero Independiente, which is a really incredible local news, mm -hmm. um, independent local news outlet. So I'm not going to go spend. So it does, again, it doesn't really. Now, what I suggested with that piece of legislation, with that that particular language, is that you provide bigger tax credits to the business to advertise in Cicero. So that, you know, it, it was a, just a, a, a little bit more of a carrot to go to that independent news outlet instead of sticking with what they've always done, businesses have always done, going advertising with the big, the big boys. And the response that I got was, we cannot um, introduce race into this conversation because, you know, it, you know, what's going to happen is they'll get sued and then the legislation will be put on hold because the administration will, will get sued because it's now we're talking, we're crafting out or carving out a space for, based around race. Um, and I'm saying that while I'm not saying we need to burn everything down and start fresh and new, and I don't think Simon is saying that either, I am saying that we need to take um, a few more risks and we need to push that envelope. I think the same thing happened with the black farmers and I know they're still trying to get their dollars based on discrimination that happened um, at the hands of the federal government, but they were successful, right? They were, they successfully sued. And I think that um, this, you know, while this is not exactly the same thing, I think the kind of the principle, the principle is. And, and so I, I do believe not just the federal government, but uh, and Simon and I have talked about this a little bit, but the media industry as a whole has created a lot, has created significant harm against communities of color um, and marginalized groups in this country. And I, one of the things that we, I, will, I hope we get a chance to talk about is Media 2070, because I believe that's, that it started trying to address some of those um, in terms of reparations. Great. Well, we have about 10 minutes left, so hopefully that's something we can uh, go to uh, on that. Um, let's talk about risk then. Let's talk about the fact that I think, you know, one of the messages perhaps that I take away from this is that Build Back Better and the support it provides to journalism is better than nothing, but it should be the start of a conversation and a dialogue that brings in a variety of different types of uh, support for a wide range of different organizations and information providers. In the time that we've got left, perhaps I can ask each of you to talk about the one thing that you would most like to see uh, happen from your perspective. And um, and I appreciate there's a raft of them. You, you may want to just list a bunch of things and then go deep on, on one. Um, Simon, I, I'm going to ask you to start with this uh, difficult quest, difficult and thorny question, but... Sure, I mean, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to list a, a couple start? of big things and, and in like short order, though, mm. I, just a shout out to Media 2070 again, Alicia Bell and I wrote a, P, a meme in lab prediction last year about media reparations, envisioning a billion dollar fund from the Knight Foundation, which uh, profited off of the ads for this and sale, the sale of enslaved black people and a, sl a slew of other media sort of wrongs that have occurred over the last 200 years. Um, so we could see philanthropy, major philanthropy be, begin to spend towards media justice in a significant way. Um, I think we need uh, federal investment in new hyperlocal public media, um, you, you know, thinking about and working with people who are actually comfortable centering the conversation around race and inequality to address those underlying systemic needs that have been for so long ignored. Um, and then at the local level, I think state and municipal governments need to really begin thinking about mimicking what Graciela has accomplished at CCM and really more broadly thinking about how are they investing, how are they insourcing their local news and information dollars? How are they investing in the people who live there and the residents who live there when they spend their public access dollars, when they spend their communications dollars? Um, and ultimately, I think that 
like all public goods, um, and these local news information should be like a base level local news information, like not necessarily capital J journalism, but should be like a, like a right in this country, access to community and civic engagement and civic participation. And I think those should be managed as public utilities. So I think that there's a, there's a long way to go. And a lot of these solutions are, I think, are hopefully will one day add up to, to, to that world and that place for all of us. Well, and you've offered some suggestions about how to fund journalism like a public utility. Would you like to just quickly summarize that before we move to the other panelists? Sure. So uh, the, our, our the chief initiative for the Community Info Co-op, um, which was actually envisioned at CUNY when I was in grad school there. So CUNY Connections, um, the best J school in the land. Uh, we came up with a tax tax like a like a policy solution for funding local news and information that mimics business improvement districts, library districts across the country. Effectively, a community would elect to tax themselves per household, depending on what you see fit. In Bloomfield, that's a population of fifty thousand people. Um, if you ta if each person paid a uh, five dollar tax every year um, to fund local news and information in our community. That would be $250,000, which is plenty to run a community newsroom here. Um, but there's also like existing public dollars that are being like spent willy nilly on other nonsense <laughs> that we really need to, we could just really sort of focus on uh, reorienting towards information needs in our community because that's the ultimate question. And then we just need to put public accountability and public governance on top of that. Thank you, Simon. And um, we will post that. There we go. We'll post out some information uh, to that proposal, which I think one of the things that I really like about that is that it builds on existing precedent and just treats journalism in the same way, as you said, uh, as a utility. Um, Tracy, let's come to you next and we'll hear from Graciela and we will do a hard stop at the top of the hour. Um, but um, these are really important topics. So, Tracy, um, what, what's, what's the kind of big thing that you would most like to see? enacted that you think would make a real difference to the communities that you are representing and advocating for? You know, I, I, I've kind of mentioned a, a couple already of things that I think can be done, but I think the biggest thing for journalism, period, is that we um, really start focusing and centering community. And that's something that we just, if, you know, we complain about, you know, democracy, saving our democracy, but a lot of people don't even know what's going on in their own backyards. They just, they don't know. They're not, not you know, they're ill-equipped and ill-informed um, to really understand how the system um, is working around them and it, you know, creates apathy. Um, I also think that, um, because there's so much focus and attention, again, on saving our local newspapers rather than local news and really being of service to community that, you know, our mission gets lost. People have lost a lot of trust in, in, in this industry, in journalists themselves, in journalism. They don't understand what it is and really don't care anymore. And so the people that the Pivot Fund invests in are those journalists and, and news outlets who are already in conversation with these communities. Um, they are um, part of the conversation that's happening on, on WhatsApp and, and other you know, to, you know, to platforms. And I think that if the industry um, focused on, you know, focused on those kind of innovative ways that people are actually really consuming information and supporting that, um, we were, we'd wind up on the right side of things. Um, rather than focusing on a, a particular news organization or a particular name, journalist, or what have you. Um, we really should start at community and I think we can we can build from there. Thank you, Tracy. And Gracia, a, a final word from you on this. What's top of yeah, your so I, I totally agree with Tracy. And I would I would say for the for the community media outlets, I would like to see more resources going their way. If you ask any publisher what is the one thing they want, they'll tell you money. Um, and you know they're so severely under-resourced, uh, but they do have most of them do have the trust of their communities still very much, and we've seen that during the pandemic. And so more resources and to be taken seriously and to be you know seen as equal, even if the type of journalism they do is um, you know is not the type of 
journalists that most you know funders or um, advertisers consider the the one that you know the model that the only acceptable model this is you know deeply you know uh, uh, outlets deeply serving their communities it's service journalism is very creative uh, there's also extraordinary you know writing and reporting and at the same time there's this um you know long you know tradition of being of service and of doing uh, specific interventions when when things get you know uh, difficult for their communities and for the mainstream media newsrooms i would say that and i know many are trying and that's a huge conversation taking place now in the journalism but is that they finally find a way to look more like the communities they serve you know it's been decades and decades trying to diversify quote unquote and it's um and it's not happening so i, I hope to see that effort to succeed I know that was one of the topics I'd hope we'd have time to explore, but unfortunately we haven't. I could very easily have chatted with each of you for an hour and then some uh, on this really interesting uh, topic. Uh, but I do want to be cognizant of the time of everybody who has joined us today and also for our expert panelists. So we will draw to a close there. Lots of great ideas on the table and Nick is going to make sense of this conversation and distill it into a write-up for the Tao uh, newsletter. We'll also publish the audio and video from today's session on Tao's social channels in the next couple of weeks. So do keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, my thanks to our three expert panelists today, Graciela Moshkovsky, Tracy Powell and Simon Galperin. Thank you very much uh, to each of you for joining us today. We will be back in uh, 2022 on Thursday, the 21st of January at the same time, 4 p.m. Eastern, the third Thursday of the month, where we'll be discussing some of the new and fresh ideas on the media policy table from a number of, uh, of great people who are thinking about this topic very deeply. Uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us today and uh, to our panelists for such a wonderful discussion over the last hour. Thank you. Thanks, David.